Crusoe your pod lady of the V Phil Wyman. Have you? With ein Sharad um Summit Gumri. Uh oops. Uh sorry for all you Pentecostals. This podcast will be in tongues today. And that tongue is a foreign language. That foreign language is English. Maybe everyone in Wales speaks English, but it truly is a foreign language in the land of Cymraeg. So stick with me. This will be an English podcast, but I'll be talking to you about my upcoming move to Wales. Theology, and I am your wild-haired host, Phil Wyman. Um, if you can make a point of like clicking like or you know um, signing up for my page, whether it's on YouTube or in Podbean or wherever you're seeing this, please do so. That helps me. Um, today, you'll have to excuse me. I've had a sore throat for a while, and so this may be a bit of cut and paste with me drinking tea or coughing crazily um, in between takes. So if that happens, if you see, you know, glitches and stops and restarts, that's what's going on. Anyway, so like my little intro said, we're going to be talking about my move to Wales. And so that's happening on uh, May the 4th. 2022, for those of you who are now looking back in time at this podcast, um, this is me talking about what's going to be happening on my uh, mission to Wales, I guess you would call it, um, my uh, wild adventures into uh, the country of Wales, a place that I love deeply. And uh, like, like I said in that intro, um, this will be in English. Do them chatter, come like three, but let the other won't be speaking Welsh um, um, through the podcast, uh, so that everybody can get it. And 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 I made a point of saying that uh, that English is a foreign language in the nation of Wales, which is a true statement. The original language of the people of that land is Cymraeg, or what. We call in English Welsh. And part of my uh, mission, uh, my move to Wales, involves me having to become fluent in Welsh. Um, A lot. (laughs) So I have to become fluent in Welsh, and so... I'm having to, I'm going to have to do a lot of study. Um, I'm in that uncomfortable space between the learner who sounds like he knows what he's doing and the person who's actually fluent. So I've been mistaken for being fluent on a number of times that I've been in Wales, only to be uh, incredibly embarrassed by that. (laughs) And that that will be part of my... uh, part of my ongoing transition. So May the 4th is the date. May the 4th be with you. Yes, um, that's, uh, that's the date I arrive in um, in, Pretain in uh, Great Britain and uh, make my way up to North Wales and I'll be moving somewhere near or in Carnarvon, which is a place that might be considered the hotbed, the central point of uh, Welsh language and and culture, at least in the north, 
Um, large percentage of people um, speak Welsh in Carnarvon. Uh, over 90% in and around the city of Carnarvon. And uh, so it's extremely important that I become fluent in Welsh. And for those of you who are praying folk, please pray for me. Uh, the, the interesting thing about um, learning a new language is that in order to carry over all of the things that we do in our first language into a second language requires what feels to me like learning multiple languages. In English, I've had to learn the languages of music when I studied music. I had to learn the language of uh, philosophy as I was um, studying and reading philosophy. And it feels like with every philosophical school, there's a new set of words and uh, a language to dialogue about that, that field. Um, it's the same with science. It, it, uh, it's the same with theology, another uh, thing that I've studied. And so I had to learn a language within a language, as it were. Now, those are all the things, uh, music and um, theology and philosophy are things I want to carry with me into the Welsh language. So <laughs> my, my level of uh, expertise is, is going to have to be uh, pretty strong. And, and I could use your prayers for that. So this has been a dream of mine for quite some time. So what I'll do is just lay out the background story of why a move to Wales is uh, so important to me and why I feel um, blessed or you might say um, fortunate that there are a group of, group of people who live there who love me and are waiting for me to arrive. <laughs> when things like that happen, I'm always a bit surprised. You know, I, I, I know I'm somewhat of a clown. Okay. Some of you are probably laughing right now and going, somewhat of a clown, really? No, you're a complete clown. Um, <laughs> and, and so I'm, I, but I am, I'm, I'm surprised when um, uh, I, I, I find that, that people feel uh, helped by my presence. Um, that's, and, and, and when they want to help in return, that, that's always a surprise to me on the inside. Something jumps up and goes, ooh, 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 I'm okay. I'm not such a weirdo after all. Um, so um, I, I do feel incredibly blessed to be headed there. And a big reason for that is because I do love whales very deeply. And um, even as I say that, um, every time I say those words, that I have fallen in love with whales, um, something wells up inside of me. <clears throat> and it can be difficult sometimes to hold back a tear. And it's, it's not a tear of sorrow. It's a, it, it's a tear of joy and of concern and care and passion. Um, and I tend to be that kind of person. I, um, you know, I, I wear my uh, emotions on my sleeves. Um, I, my friend from... Uh, from Wales, Aaron Jones with say something in Welsh. He'll say, you know, it's, it's we we wear our, we wear our hearts on our sleeves. Is the way he describes the Welsh people, and and I've always been a bit like that myself. So um, it's hearts on sleeves here, um, with my passion for Wales. First time I went to Cymru, the Welsh name for Wales, was. Um, a little more than 15 years ago. And I, it had been something that was a part of my own desire for a long, long time. I grew up in Southern California, 6,000 miles away from uh, the land of Wales. But my mother is a Jones. <laughs> so um, somewhere in the family history, dating back to the 1600s, late 1600s, I believe, a man by the name of Philip Jones traveled 
um, from Wales to the United States. Well, before it was the United States came to America, before this was a nation, and was uh, apparently an indentured servant on a ship and had to work off his years, you know, before he was a free man to do what he wanted to do. Um, but that was the beginning of my mother's line um, coming from Wales, somewhere in Wales, you know, which I don't know if I'd be able to find that. The shipping records at Harvard might um, have, you know, a place he came from. It's not something I've been able to, to check. Um, but um, all we, and, and finding a Jones in Wales is look, like looking for a needle in a needle stack. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of Joneses in Wales. So Philip Jones came in the late 1600s to America. And, and so my, my mother would talk about, uh, you know, this Welsh heritage that we had from time to time. And, of course, that was during the time that Tom Jones was really popular, and she was quite a fan of Tom Jones. So, you know, I had to watch Tom Jones with his TV show back in the late 60s and, and, uh, and Mom's interest in that. And I remember one time, and she doesn't even remember this, but it stuck in my head. She said something to me about, oh, my little Welshman, which was a funny statement because she didn't... She doesn't speak Welsh. She didn't grow up with a lot of emphasis on this Welsh heritage, but um, somehow she ingrained that in me. And it wasn't until I moved to Salem, Massachusetts in 1999 that I began to think about, boy, I can travel um, now much easier to the UK. And so it was a few years after that that I uh, um, went to Wales for the, when I traveled to the UK. And yes, I landed in London, but I beat feet to the middle of Wales. And when I say the middle of Wales, I mean the middle of Wales, to uh, um, the middle of Powys, and um, to start a walk along the Wye River um, from the top of it. Um, at Hreder down to uh, Chepstow. And that was the beginning of my um, enamorment with Wales. As soon as I landed there, it felt like my feet were on, on soil that um, somehow was a, a part of me. And at that point began this interest in someday moving to Wales. The day is coming. I'm so excited. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> um, so, I, um, I, I started at that point just saying a few words here and there, you know, Croeso <laughs> to people as I met them, or when I was being served in a shop. And sometimes people spoke Welsh and sometimes they didn't. Um, but for a number of years, I, I went back. To Wales, and I even even took some teams from the church I was pastoring in Salem, Massachusetts, to of all things um, help serve food at a gorlan, which means the sheepfold, which was at the Welsh National Eisteddfod, a, a big cultural event of Welsh poetry and and music and literature, um, art. It's a fantastic event. It's the largest event of its kind in Europe, I believe, um, based around language and culture, uh, specifically language and culture of a nation. And so um, we would go, and of course we weren't Welsh speakers except for a word here and there, and we would flip burgers, flipping burgers on a gorlan, um, uh, and uh, and and so even even some of the people in my church began to have some heart for Wales themselves by being there, and it so th this interest grew and grew, and I started to try and learn a little bit of Welsh, despite the fact that I was living, you know, three thousand miles away and my opportunity to speak Welsh with somebody who spoke Welsh was 
uh, at best once a month um, in, in the Boston area. Uh, but then I went through some extremely difficult times. And this is where my story about my interest and love for whales um, takes a little bit deeper turn. So, um, in, in, uh, 2000, oh, I can't even remember the dates here, seven or eight, perhaps, the Foursquare denomination, um, accused myself and our church of being heretics because we were friends with neo-pagans, friends with witches. Now, I was living in Salem, Massachusetts. It was like, but they're our neighbors. What else are we going to do? We're, you know, we're here to do the gospel and befriend people. And we saw that many times <clears throat> the, uh, the churches or other Christians in Salem had a biased attitude against neo-pagans and witches and sometimes even told stories about them that weren't true. And I, I didn't, I, I, I don't believe the church should do that kind of thing. We should speak the truth. Even if the truth m makes us look bad, the truth always wins. Because um, if the truth makes us look bad, then that means we need to repent. And if we're treating people poorly, we need to be called to account for that. So, you know, we, we befriended witches, and if somebody told a lie about them, we stood up for the witches and said, no, that's not true. And then that happened in a number of cases. And <laughs> and uh, and story about there was one of those glitches where I coughed, and um, so two things happened. One was that the denomination gave us one of the largest grants. In fact, at that time, it was the largest grant that had ever been given to a local church um, for its evangelism efforts, and it was based around our work around befriending the neo-pagan community. Um, simultaneously, we were accused of being heretics and we were kicked out of the denomination. You know, it's just like the right hand, the left hand. They didn't know what they were doing. But uh, so that occurred. And a few years later, um, uh, my wife left me. Um, and, you know, when... You've been married for 27 years, and um, you were married fairly young, at, you know, at 24. Um, you don't know much else, and that rocked my world. Um, and in my heart, I was still deeply in love, but there you go. And I needed a place to run. For a period of time, had some great people who helped uh, take over the church and run things while I was away, and I spent um, maybe a month in Wales because I needed to run to a place that felt like now that I don't really have a place that feels like home, a place that would feel at least like home to my heart. So I went to Wales, and in a very real way that trip did something for me that I felt like it saved my life. And when that occurred, I felt like I needed to be able to give something back to the nation. Well, a few years prior to that, I had seen a, uh, an exhibit at Carnarvon Castle in North Wales, the same place where I'm planning to move. And in this exhibit, it was an, it was an exhibit about the Prince of Wales. And for those of you who don't know, the Prince of Wales is a title given to somebody in English, in the family of nobility, um, in the, uh, you know, the, the son of the queen currently is the Prince of Wales, and there's nothing Welsh about the Prince of Wales. He's part of the English nobility. 
and yet he's given that title as though he's a Welshman himself. And yes, Charles spoke a little bit of Welsh when he was inducted as the Prince of Wales at Carnarvon Castle, but he doesn't speak it fluently. And I remember standing at that exhibit knowing that the last native-born Prince of Wales, Llewellynap Griffith, who was um, betrayed uh, on, on, a, on his way to have some dialogue with the battling English armies, um, was shanghai as it were, and uh, beheaded, and his head was hung in the Tower of London, and... So from that point on, the English, uh, a number of years later, took the title Prince of Wales and bequeathed it to the uh, son of king, the king or queen. I stood there looking at that exhibit, and I thought, the Prince of Wales can't even be... Um, troubled to learn the Welsh language and live in it. And this is a language that has struggled with survival for over a thousand years. And with the incoming of English and dominant languages trying to suppress them, and yet it remains the strongest. Um, the testimony to the uh, stubbornness of the people of Wales. It remains the strongest of the Celtic languages in the world. But I thought to myself, if that foreign-born prince of Wales can't um, care enough to speak Welsh, then somebody from outside needs to be able to do it. Now, I, I've got a number of friends, American friends and people from other places around the world who are fluent Welsh speakers who who live there now, and they've done that same thing. But I, I said to myself, um, self, I want to not only learn Welsh, but there's another thing I would like to do, and this is where my travels to Wales and my going to live there come into play. I want to spend a year and a day walking around the country by foot going from village to village. O dre i dre ac yn siar a dimi aeth o'n Gymraeg. I mean, vloedd yn ac yn dydd. So, walking around from place to place, from village to village, and not speaking any language but Welsh, for a year and a day. That's uh, <clears throat> that's my uh, that's my dream. And of course, that's only part of moving there. And and yeah, I know it sounds all very dramatic and perhaps even silly, but but it's something. Things like this are meaningful things. They say something about commitment. They say something about our love for people. They say something about our love for the culture of others, that we would commit ourselves to do something that is it's outside the box. And, yeah, I guess I'm a naturally kind of a clown, so that, that fits me. But there you go. Um, so this is, this is the dream. Um, move to Wales. And in the first year or two... Just embed myself into the community in Carnarvon and work with Indebedadoyer um, Cymru, the Baptist Union of Wales, and Caer um, uh, uh, Salem, Carnarvon, the uh, the Baptist Church, Caer Salem, in in the town of Carnarvon, um, and then uh, hopefully starting perhaps at an Eisteddfod in in August, um, in about a year, then begin my walk across Wales um, with dim says Nick, with with no English. That's that's my dream, um, and 
um, there there are people, you know, and I, I have been doing something that I absolutely hate, I've been asking, you know, for support for this. And a number of you have been uh, unbelievably gracious. And so at this point in time, I have um, about six months of um, support uh, that uh, is, is, is in hand, which is something I need to make the move. Um, I, as a missionary on the visa that I have, there's very little work I can actually do in, um, in in Great Britain, um, by, by virtue of the visa, because they, you know, they don't want us foreigners, they stealing jobs from people. So, yeah, so I, um, but there is some work that I will be able to do, and and you know, as a writer and musician and speaker, you know some, those things can can come into play some, but uh, there there's required for there to be a bit of missionary support, which I have to raise myself, and so I here comes the bag, please. <laughs> <coughs> there I go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, if you would, if you'd like to help support this dream, um, that would help me take this dream to the level I want to. Um, to move to the land that helped save me in uh, my most difficult times. And be there to be a, a language, an artistic, and a um, moral support for a group of people who have been, in, in a very real way, uh, mistreated by the very country they live in for a long time long time. They and their parents and their parents before them and generations before them. But um, they've stood strong and happy and I find it to be a most wonderful place to be. So my heart goes there and I hope that uh, I can bring you with me perhaps sometimes. Um, come with me. Visit me in Wales when I'm there. Would love to see you. And if you're one of the people who live there and you're already there, I'll see you soon. this work by uh, looking below or wherever it may be, whether in Facebook or uh, YouTube or on Podbean, look into the uh, notes and there will be a link to support as well as links to uh, my email list where there's a about weekly update on how things are going and what's happening. And I would love to have you join me as part of this adventure. Dilkavarion. <laughs>